days, our final speaker will be Adranto Francis, and he is from uh, the Baltimore region. He is the founder of the Freedom and Prosperity Educational Campaign um, for liberal Bosnia and Herzegovina, and as well as accompanying uh, TV, uh, the Return Korean Network of Alternative Media in the Western Balkans. Um, he's also the director of the New Media and a senior fellow at the Adriatic Institute of Public Policy. And today we'll be speaking on um, the lack of tapes of Yugoslavia's communist rulers and what they've been missing out by uh, ruling out Milton Friedman's, uh, <coughs> Milton Friedman's ideas and the impact that it can have on this region, as well as the risk of persecution persecution faced by independent speakers and pushing these ideas for the time by his mental Well, good evening everybody. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here with you tonight. And it's a great privilege to have been asked by uh, Lion Rock Institute to speak in the, in the honor of uh, my personal hero, Milton Friedman. Um, I was first introduced to Milton Friedman's ideas in 2007 uh, while watching the famous uh, Free to Choose 10 part series, which I devoured in one sitting. Um, I was greatly impressed by Dr. Friedman's uh, arguments but even more so by the way in which he uh, talked about the, the ideas of, of freedom. Once I saw the series and then I just went on uh, researching everything that I could find that, that's from Milton Friedman, all his books, all his lectures, uh, all his interviews. Uh, and the thing it, it dawned on me is that, that the ideas of Milton Friedman were so simple and I told myself, if I could show some of these things to people in my country, I think we would have all of our problems solved in just a few years. And that's the part of the, my personal story, was to try to spread the ideas of Dr. Friedman in, in, in the region of Western Balkans. And it didn't turn out the way I thought it would. I thought it would be a real easy thing to try to, you know, once people see these ideas and, and we solve our problems. However, it's turned out that it's very difficult to to get the ideas of freedom in, in a communist society to be shown around. So uh, my tonight's speech is uh, about failures to embrace the ideas of Milton Friedman and missed opportunities for economic prosperity in Western Balkans. Um, just for you who don't uh, didn't like uh, geography much in your school, uh, well, Balkans is in, uh, in the yellow color. And Western Balkans, uh, more uh, commonly known as countries of former Yugoslavia. Those are uh, Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia, Slovenia, Serbia, Montenegro, and Macedonia. We will be begin with um, with Yugoslavia, as Milton Friedman found it. Milton and Rose Friedman visited Yugoslavia in 1962 and 1973. They spent there for a couple of, couple of weeks each time. First time they came straight from uh, Moscow, from Soviet Union. And Milton Friedman's uh, impressions about Yugoslavia were quite were very favorable because they didn't feel that they were ever followed around uh, they were free to talk to people if people would respond back so it was not very repressive like the Soviet Union um, he was even allowed to visit uh, regional central banks and and was offered a, a view to into their papers into how the how the monetary policy of Yugoslavia works. He even gave some talks on, on monetary policy and also on his consumption function. Uh, he was very interested in uh, worker ownership and self-management model. Uh, this model is very, was very unique to Yugoslavia. So let's take a look, quick look at that. Uh, here we have a, a private uh, free market model where private owners, they invest, they own, and they tell the company workers and managers what they sh can produce and how can they produce, and they also reap the ultimate benefits uh, 
the profits. Collective ownership model, of course, on top you have a state or a party, the only one political party in existence, and the company was told in a top-down approach through, through managers who were members of, loyal members of, of the one political party, Basically, they were told what to produce, how to produce it, and nobody was really responsible for, for what comes out. However, as uh, worker self-management model in Yugoslavia, we have a state still owns it, a state finances it initially, uh, but uh, workers through uh, workers uh, decide what do they what they produce and how they produce it. Uh, they they choose a committee. And in that committee, they find out who the best and brightest among the workers are, and they put them as managers of the company. And that managers tell everybody else what to do. The theory goes that uh, it was in workers' self-interest to find the best possible managers so that they can earn as much as possible. Because all the earnings in the end came back into the company and into the workers. And this is where Milton Friedman found uh, some serious flaws. Uh, one flaw it was um, that once a worker decides to leave the company, he has no shares in it. So whatever uh, earnings that the company made and whatever they didn't decide to split amongst the workers and went back into the business, it is, is forever gone. So that's one of the serious flaws. Um, but the biggest flaw came from external financing. In Yugoslavia, the only way that worker enterprises could, could get external financing was uh, asking other worker enterprises to, to finance it. So for example, you could have a textile company uh, financing a metal works company. So all of a sudden you have a textile company uh, trying to be a, a banking institution and an investment institution. And that didn't work really well. However, we have, um, is the last working? Okay, here we have, um, regional investment banks, which were also workers' enterprises. So they could invest money in these companies, but oftentimes they didn't want to because those were risky enterprises down there. So what happened is that central government would often put pressure on these regional banks, investment banks, to, to make them, to, to give funding to the, these other businesses. And once they ran out of the money, of course, there, there was a regional central bank that they would print the money and supply that money. So Friedman found out that this was the major cause of inflation in Yugoslavia. And so he concluded that the major problem of uh, worker ownership and self-management uh, enterprises was in finding proper mechanism for financing risky businesses. So that was, in a way, Milton Friedman's first warning about uh, flaws in Yugoslavia. We go to 1989 when Yugoslavia was really at the crossroads. We had the arrival of nationalists, especially in the republics of Croatia, Bosnia, and Serbia. And that's also the time when Yugoslavia uh, decided to do some reforms. At that time came a new prime minister. His name was Ante Markovic. He was the uh, Western, first Western-style politician in Yugoslavia who favored market reforms. So his reforms lasted from 1989 to 1991, and uh, these are some of the things that he did. A monetary discipline, meaning no printing money out of thin air. Uh, they introduced a new convertible dinar, which went uh, seven dinars for one uh, Deutsche Mark. Uh, he allowed for the first time in history, he allowed formation of limited liability companies. Uh, he, he liberalized accumulation exchange of foreign currencies, so everyday people and businesses could freely buy and, and store a foreign currency. Uh, he liberalized about 90% of imports. Uh, and he also forced insolvent businesses to, into bankruptcy and then also reduced military spending. In doing so, he had the help of Western advisors from uh, Ronald Reagan administration. There's two of them, Steve Hanke and Alvin Wurska. 
And also from the IMF came Jeffrey Sachs. He's known for doing uh, uh, market reforms in Chile in, uh, and also in Eastern, in other countries of Eastern Europe. Even though he was uh, um, ideologically opposed to Milton Friedman, he appreciated Friedman's ideas on, on, on market and, and, and how, how market operates. So he, he was also instrumental in getting the shock therapy implemented. Uh, what were the results of 17 months of interrupted reform? Because the war came and then reforms were, were not continued until the end. They were supposed to last four to five years. So in only 17 months, here, here's what we have. After just one month of reform, the, the results were becoming obvious. The store shelves all of a sudden overnight became full of food. Uh, people were became hope, hopeful for life. Many businesses were formed. I remember a good friend of mine who remembers that time who formed his own company. He said this, this was the time of Yugoslavia's El Dorado. Uh, foreign debt was reduced uh, in half. However, I'm, I'm not sure whether there was the there was the incentive from the IMF. They may have forgiven some of that debt in order to encourage Yugoslavia to continue with, for, with reforms, and some of it may have actually been returned. Uh, also, there were some bad effects of those reforms, but those, actually those are good good effects, as as we know, uh, because. When you have a rotten parts of the economy, you want to get liquidated as soon as possible. But communists saw that as a bad thing. And so here we have uh, 280, 248 companies bankrupted and 89,000 people lost their jobs by the end of the first year. And then further uh, 889 and 525,000 in So this really scared the communists. So they basically started blocking all the reforms and also the, the wars were at that time, at, at the mid-1990s, mid started happening. So the, the reform was basically stopped. But that was the beginning. Today, we are in a state of suspended animation. Um, we have six independent countries. Uh, they have gotten their independence, but we're still not free. At least economically, we're not free. We have changed names, but we have same people in power. So uh, some of the reforms that were done during Markovic's time were continued, but they have remained partial. Privatization of uh, worker enterprises was the biggest, biggest problem of all. Um, but to me, the saddest thing of all is that we never gave a chance to free market to, to uh, reform the, the social program. So for example, uh, we still have educational institutions that uh, indoctrinate students. We have um, hospitals that are a source of um, epidemics where healthy people go to get sick. We have um, retirement fund that's constantly being uh, raided and that new people are be being added to it without having a single day of work on their resume, but they have, of course, uh, been uh, subservient to the political class so that they can get retirement. Um, so basically, we now have six mini new Yugoslavias. Independence means nothing if you cannot, if you don't understand what freedom can do for you. Um, just quickly, I want to show you the heritage index of economic freedom. Hong Kong is number one, of course. Uh, number 43 is Macedonia, and we have hundred, number 103 is Bosnia and Herzegovina. But you would think that there's a great difference between these countries, but there isn't. The living standards of people are similar. And if you go there to invest, you won't find much difference in, between those two countries. Why? Because they have failed to, to do some uh, most basic of re reforms. Um, one of the big, biggest problems is property rights. If you take a look over there, um, hey, other than Slovenia, um, oops, what is the mouse? which is here, all the other countries of 
former Yugoslavia are in red. So is much of uh, Eastern Europe. So that is a great problem. Imagine you have, have a company invested in, in Bosnia or in Croatia and all of a sudden government comes to you and says, oh, sorry, we have nationalized your, your company. It's, it belongs to us. Uh, freedom from corruption. That's a great, great problem in Western Balkans. Um, corruptions, I, I wanted to tell you a little a human story about that, but I don't, don't think I had the time to do, do it at, at, at this time. So maybe I can, you know, in our further conversation, I can tell some of you about, about that. But just, just quickly, I want to tell you that any, any one of these actions here, like for example, getting a diploma, uh, finding a job, or starting your own business and or running your own business, for all that you need to pay money to bureaucrats. Uh, government spending, well, if you look here, of course, entire Europe is in red. But that is because they are sitting to, on the same bus together with the, with the countries of Western Balkans. Um, and they're all going down. Uh, Slovenia has already been asking for some uh, bailouts. Croatia is next. Just quickly, I want to, I want to show you the, the last uh, row here. Uh, net salary is the percent of the spending basket. Uh, you can see that for a family of four, only Slovenia, there's enough money in a paycheck to, to cover the basic, basic needs. And if you look at the top, uh, unemployed and youth unemployed, they're both in double digits. Uh, how hard is life in Western Balkans? Well, those of you who watch Discovery Channel might get this one. Come to Bosnia and survive in $200 a month, two bank loans, three kids, and so on. Well, I can tell you that probably about 30% of people, families in, US, in, in, in Bosnia, in my country, live this way. How can they survive? I don't know. Uh, Milton Friedman's recipe for, for prosperity. This is what he advised Croatia to do in, in 2004. And he said that rule of law is paramount, is the number one thing. You can do uh, economic reforms, but if you don't have rule of law, it's good for nothing. Uh, over in, in the West, Western countries, people in the West, they take rule of law for granted. However, in Balkans, it's, it's a different story. Uh, you need to have independent and efficient judiciary, protection of property rights, he advised for no customs at all and very low taxes only when absolutely necessary. And then um, when it came to economic reforms, he advised shock therapy. But only after we have rule of law in place. Uh, when you think of uh, some of the countries of former Soviet Union, like for example Russia, we can see how lack of rule of law has led to some really unintended consequences. Um, there's a little quote here, it says, um, Croatia can benefit from the exposure to the fresh air of free market thinking and the experience of other formerly communist states in the region. Um, are we embracing the power of the market at last? Well, it seems uh, that would not be the case. Uh, just first I want to say that uh, Slovenia has become a member of the European Union in 2004 and Croatia has become a member of the European Union just uh, at the beginning of this month, July 1st, 2013. And if you look at the rest of the map, of course, uh, our destiny is, is, is in Europe. But is the Europe going to uh, finally bring us free markets? Uh, if you look at the earlier years, Europe was all about four freedoms. Free flow of capital, goods, services, and people. Thank you. There you go. Uh, however, nowadays we have central planning. It's all about harmonization, about bailouts, about subsidies, and about quotas. For example, Croatia, in order for it to be accepted as a member of the European Union, it, was, it had to comply with European regulation that it cannot grow more than a certain amount of uh, grapes for wine, that you cannot grow more than a certain amount of olives or olive oil, and now they've just found out that they cannot 
uh, export more than a certain amount of milk. That, to me, doesn't look like uh, that is something that comes from Martha Friedman's books. Uh, we have political union that is too political for me even to say anything about it. Social union, all hail uh, Karl Marx. And monetary union, I just want to say something about, about that. Uh, we have vastly different countries with vastly different economies being put in, in one same monetary union. This is where actually Milton Friedman, because of this, he predicted in 2002 that European Union will end, just give it five to 15 years. Um, if you don't believe me, what I told you about the European Union, you can go to YouTube and find some really great YouTube videos of what's going on in the European Parliament. Um, rather than really um, talking about some specific reforms that we could do, I wanted to I wanted to ask a question: How can we avoid repeating history? Because we've had Yugoslavia, and then we gain our independence, and now we are all marching into a new Yugoslavia. Uh, let me get this straight. In your country, people can actually vote themselves more freedom, and they don't. How is it that they don't vote themselves more freedom? Well, that's obviously because people don't even know what freedom is all about. They need to be taught what freedom is all about. And who is doing that in Western Balkans? Who is continuing the Friedman's legacy? Uh, we have a free market oriented economists since uh, 1989 that surfaced and they've been uh, fighting the battle from the outside of political sphere because they are the opposition. We, uh, in 1989, when the first limited liability companies were allowed to be started, uh, the first free market uh, book publisher came out and now we have a few dozens of free market books published in Serbian, Croatian, and in other languages. Uh, we have free market bloggers, about uh, two dozens of them. I mean, you, you could say that it's not really significant, but imagine that five years ago there were no free market bloggers on, on the blogosphere. But now we have about two dozens of them. And they're stirring up the collectives. Um, we have libertarian organizations. Um, in Slovenia we have one. Uh, Serbia, Croatia, Bosnia, we have two, and Macedonia, we have one. In, in, in Montenegro, we have none, but we have a free market university, private, of course. Um, and then also free market institutes. And I really want to say something about one that was started by none other but Milton Friedman. It's called the Adriatic Institute for Public Policy. It was started in 2004, so for nine years it's been battling the bureaucrats in, in Croatia. So, and it was really with Milton Friedman's help and in his advice that uh, Adriatic Institute has grown so that it now has about two dozens of uh, advisors who are free marketeers from, from all around the world. Um, and I'd like to end on a note about Hong Kong. Uh, we free marketeers in Western Balkans are, have our work cut, cut out for us. We need to educate the population so that, so that people will ask for more freedom. And, and it really helps to have a, a good example of free marketed work around the world. So that, for example, when I go back to my country and I talk to people and they ask me about issues, I, I can show them some really great examples. However, when we lose our freedoms here in Hong Kong, and sometimes we do, it's also a great loss for the rest of us in other countries around the world. Case in point, um, minimum wage law. Um, when people ask me about minimum wage law in Bosnia, how it was it implemented in, in Hong Kong, I have to excuse myself for, uh, for a bathroom break. And then, of course, never to return, or wait to see if the the topic will change. To, the reason to you is obvious. We have lost our battle for uh, removal of minimum wage in Hong Kong. So this is why I believe that it is actually here, in this great city, 
and that is here in this very room with Milton Friedman's intellectual children of Hong Kong that lays the greatest task of all and that is to preserve this shining beacon for the rest of the world. Thank you. So I'd like to um, thank all of our speakers, and um, uh, and, and obviously I think um, you know, not often in Hong Kong do we think about what's happening in the broader world. We're often terribly obsessed um, with what's happening here and what's happening in China, and I think it's um, very valuable to, to think about um, Europe, to think about Eastern Europe, to think about the EU, to think about the challenges that there are there for freedom and the relevance, I think, of Hong Kong to the world and those experiences to us um, quickly becomes very apparent. Um, I hope there's a lot that we can learn from all of those experiences um, and I'd like to um, open up to, uh, to questions. Um, there was obviously an invitation to talk about uh, corruption and, and other things, so hopefully we can have a, um, a, a free-flowing discussion. Yeah, with, with two of the Balkans, with two of the Balkan states joining the European Union, uh, you know, you wonder if they made a wise decision to join and kind of come under. You know, obviously they've gained some of the freedoms and the disciplines of the European Union, but they've also come under its strictures before they got wealthy. Um, could you just call it like you're you're there, you're on the ground. What is happening in terms of them trying to adjust? You talked a little bit about some of the restrictions that have been put on them, but how are they? dealing with adjusting to the European Union. Croatia, obviously, it's quite new, but they've been, in the, you know, they've been in the process of getting ready for quite some time, but how are they managing that? Yeah. Well, the deal is that politicians in, in Croatia and in Slovenia and in general in the Western Balkans, they are valued by... Thank you. They are valued by how many funds they can extract from the European Union. So that, that is really the only concern for Croatia and Slovenia. They don't really care about much about uh, really adjusting and any reform because the, the life is good. The funds are coming in, the public uh, uh, projects are being funded, and politi politicians are happy. But other than that... Um, if I could ask a, a question perhaps of both. Obviously, some parts of Eastern Europe seemed to... Um, uh, quite dramatically introduced reforms and have shown a little bit of ability to um, renew and start reform again when it gets bogged down and, and, and stops. And I'm thinking of uh, the Baltic states, which have some of which have gone through a very difficult economy, but it seemed to have um, you know, recommitted to a low tax regime and, and stable currency regime. Um, uh, you know, perhaps um, uh, Poland um, or the Czech Republic have been through phases of um, renewal and going back to old ways. Um, what might be different between some of those countries that seem to be doing a better job of increasing per capita incomes and prosperity um, and somewhere there's been less success? Um, actually, the main challenge we have in Ukraine, because Ukraine is quite quite large country, and we can follow the success of Georgia, for instance, which has also very challenging uh, starting position, and she made really a great job to this that free market economy, and we can learn a lot of from that. But in Ukraine, we have this difficult difficulties with uh, with, the, with different point of view, because. Uh, we have, our country is divided for two parts. Western part is for Euro, it's more like for free market. Not, I absolutely agree with uh, uh, my colleagues' point of view about European Union, so we are not very for European Union, because it's, it's absolutely not free market economy. But another part of Ukraine is uh, under pressure of Russia, and they, are, they prefer to be a part of Soviet Union still. So the main problem is in mind of people, say, if you ask anybody, they are sure they are free. So they even don't understand what it means to be free, what it means to, to, to have opportunity to start your own business, and just, just to add. So uh, first, uh, to answer your question, first is uh, the size of the country and that 
uh, politi politicians try to manipulate this side that uh, which way to go, Russia or Europe, and so we don't have this uh, this uh, unified uh, goal to, to, to go to, to develop economy. So, and as we see, it, I used to work in uh, governmental institutions, so that government is not motivated to, to, to make the steps forward. So that's the main, the main issue. And people, after, especially after Orange Revolution, which was quite successful, it was really a good step to freedom and to free market, uh, they're absolutely uh, disappointed after like, the everything, they, they lost everything. So they, they hoped to bring some changes, but then our candidates lost and they miss it, change, so they don't ready to, to act and to, to make some significant changes. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for coming today to remember the legacy um, of Milton Friedman. Um, I'd like to also ask you for um, your ongoing, or thank you for your ongoing support for Lion Rock and Turning Up. Ask for your ongoing support of our um, future events, functions, um, and uh, uh, and work. I, it is um, remarkable in Hong Kong how few advocates of freedom and liberty um, there are, especially with a, a broad public voice. And we're fighting very hard to make sure um, that the voice of places that have been less free, um, as well as those that recognise the freedoms of Hong Kong, um, can be heard. So I think that the work that Lion Rock um, uh, pursues is important. Um, uh, we work very closely um, with Ron Manners and his um, Mancal Economic Education Foundation um, in my other home city of Perth, um, which pursues similar objectives. And so if I could just finally um, thank Ron for his ongoing support um, of Lion Rock that's manifested by sending interns up to Hong Kong um, a couple of times a year, and that will hopefully be growing. And to thank all of our interns who come into um, uh, Lion Rock to learn about what we're doing, to learn about Hong Kong, um, to contribute their own time um, and energy, um, which uh, helps us, challenges our ideas, helps us to refine our ideas, and hopefully we can provide the benefits um, uh, of our experiences and thoughts to those people. So you know, Lion Rock is trying to um, extend and preserve uh, the educational um, legacy of Milton Friedman as well. Um, we, we often uh, embarrass that we can't do as good a job as, as he could. We can only uh, humbly learn um, uh, from, uh, from his efforts. Um, so thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much to the interns who um, introduced our speakers today and helped Helen in particular um, in, in organising the event. So thanks for everyone.